These topics, many of them will be shorter because they don't, um, they're not the basics that I want you to learn real well. They'll use all the stuff in the core, but they're a narrower subject. Okay, and the same way you do synthetic aperture, excuse me, um, by moving the radar and having stationary target like that um, golf green and the flag sticking up, you can take a, a radar on the ground and it can, from a fixed location, illuminate a rotating body in space or, or track a, rotate, a body that rotates over a long period in its tra trajectory. And a very easy way to see how measuring the Doppler at successive periods of time will translate into cross range is if you take and put a large metallic dumbbell in space two metallic spheres connected by a rod, let's say is a, an insulator, doesn't conduct at all. And it's rotating around in the plane. Now, when, when the, the radar and, both, and, both, and the dumbbells, both ends of the dumbbells, are along the same line of sight, there's going to be no radial velocity of either of those objects. But when they, as they move, one will have a positive Doppler, and the other will have a negative Doppler. And so if my hand right here is at zero Doppler, what you'll see in, a do in successive Doppler processings of different uh, bunches of pulses is you'll see at the center a big bump from both of them, and then they'll move away, and they'll move here. And if you know that it's a rigid body, you can you can and you can you can relate the cross range to the Doppler velocity. You will get and you can put them together, those scattering centers. And if they were all over a three D object, you could pile it all together and make an image of the object. Now uh, there are no images of uh, uh, satellites in orbit that are unclassified. But this is one a simulated range Doppler image that is very interesting from the uh, contribution that it was able to make. Way back decades ago, the, U the U.S. launched a uh, Skylab uh, satellite that would go up by itself, deploy um, uh, antenna and solar panels and things like that. And when it got up, they knew something wasn't right, but they didn't know what quite was what it was. Um, and so, uh, uh, different radars that have very high bandwidth uh, simulate, uh, excuse me, actually measured this satellite that was up in lower Earth orbit and came out with an image. Now, this is a simulated image of what a range Doppler image of Skylab would look like, but not the real one. It's simulated. Okay, And I got use of this image from courtesy of Lincoln Laboratory. So you can tell clearly that these panels, you know, it was all in one big cylinder in the missile, and they deployed fine, but one of these big solar panels clearly didn't deploy. And um, apparently, um, the uh, image gave NASA enough information that metaphorically speaking, when the astronauts went up to land and dock, excuse me, with Skylab, they knew what tools to bring with them so that they could manually, on spacewalks, make this, the uh, solar panel, um, you know, go out and work, and they could do their stuff. And that it's a... Uh, it was truly a, a very useful way where uh, synthetic aperture imaging um, of Skylab, when it first went up, allowed the Skylab missions to follow with men in them to be uh, very successful and do a lot of science and different things from space. And we'll go look in, in, more into synthetic aperture radar and how it works, certainly in the course. But this is a, a nice one-panel view graph. Okay, electronic countermeasures. 
Um, there, there are two kinds, really. They're the kind, this is a World War II photo of chaff. Well, they called it window then. Being dropped by bombers. That, so this would obscure uh, the bomber formations from uh, German aircraft uh, f interceptors that had radars in them and, uh, and ground-based radars. So they couldn't see exactly where the, the bomber formations were to attack them and knock them down. And that's a pa called a passive jamming. That can be active jamming where you can have a plane with a huge transmitter transmit energy towards the radar. And, 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 and this would be the radar being jammed because this signal from another location will put a huge signal in the side lobes of the antenna and hopefully lower the signal to noise ratio so that the aircraft can't be detected. And that's one reason we want to put nulls in the side lobes of the directions of the jammer. And that's, I think, really, that's what I've said in these words. Okay? Now, um, as I go on with subjects I've, you know, I've, I've given a lecture in jammers. I haven't, I've never done one on this. It took me about 20 years to get to the point I, or I knew enough about all the different parts of radars that if you gave me a set of performance requirements, I could sit down and say, well, with all these different performance criteria and constraints, cost being a big one, you could see, you could meet the re operational requirements of the radar with all these constraints. There's a, it's, a, it's almost like a giant nonlinear equation you want to solve. It's sometimes not linear, but it's got constraints on it to constrain the, and people who do that are, are radar synthesizers. And I'm going to make an attempt um, after having learned that technique at how one would go about this in a rational way as best I can. And it's sort of a problem for me. And what I get together that I think is would teach other people how to do that, I'm going to put together in a lecture. So we'll talk, you know, I don't know what's going to evolve, but I'm going to try and do that. Okay? Uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is an advance that hasn't been taken completely openly by the, the whole world out there, but eventually is really going to. Traditional radar system architectures uh, are built where you have a main computer uh, and they connect up to a, a big custom box of proprietary interfaces from the computer to, to the receiver, exciter, the waveform generator, the antenna control, a signal processor, and, and just bits are flowing back and forth, bits. And these are, are, are built with, a lot of times, with very custom-made equipment, expensive. And these ra radars that, where the antenna and receiver are on the other side are very hard to debug because there are bits flying back and forth. And you don't know, at the bit level, in real-time systems, it's very hard to debug one piece and know it's not the other pieces interacting. The, the, the radar systems open... Uh, open Systems Architecture, was developed um, at Lincoln Laboratory. Uh, Steve Rado gets the kudos for that idea. And and he, in designing a radar that uh, we've developed at the laboratory, the first one, Cobra Gemini radar, he felt the best way to do this was to have all these different subsystems, first of all, absolutely minimize the use of cuts, uh, to minimize the use of custom hardware. And in the first generation, Rosa, I think there was maybe one, one or two or three COTS boards in all of these subsystems. And to have a, se a separate rack for each subsystem. And all the other boards be off the shelf. You can get anywhere in the country like you can go. And that the interfaces be all off the shelf with a common Ethernet. Most important thing, is the and all industry standard interfaces. The most important thing is the exciter, receiver, antenna controller, and signal processor and whatever would send high level messages to the main computer that did the tracking. Like the main computer would say, point the antenna at a range of this and an azimuth of this. The, the main computer wouldn't take part in uh, the servo mechanisms. All that stuff 
would be handled in the antenna controller. And when you do that, you can debug each of these systems isolated with a, with a simulator, simulating the main controller, the main computer, which would have displays and do the number crunching, so that you can develop the system in parallel. And that way, when you get one system, subsystem, like the receiver subsystem working, and you can exciter, signal processor, the antenna controller, the main controller knows what it accepts, high order messages, and you can debug a whole radar system in orders of magnitude less time, save huge amounts of time. And th that we found at Lincoln Laboratory has been a very fruitful way to modify different radars. And it's being picked up slowly but surely by industry. But I'm going to give you a, a lecture on that. It probably isn't the most up to date because I've been retired for a fair amount of years, but it'll give you a beginnings of it. Okay. Next is over the horizon radars. I always like to talk about over the horizon radars because they actually worked on one back in the 1970s on data from one when I was at the MITRE Corporation. It was the radar that was built for Maine for air defense. Um, and, over, and also I'm an amateur radio operator, which is a communications system. It uses the ionosphere and it's between these wavelengths. So I, I know about the ionosphere. Um, the ionosphere, are the, the frequencies that over the, horizon rad, over the horizon radars work at are very, very different than microwave frequencies and that they don't just go up and over and look into space, but when they hit the ionosphere, they bend down and hit the Earth. So they'll have a big clutter problem. And at these wavelengths that the ionosphere works and does this, it's uh, typically 10 to 80 meters in wavelength. And so that this gives them the opportunity to detect t targets truly that are very long ranges, aircraft and ships in the order of 2,000 miles. And from the ground. And here's an example of one over the horizon radar. It's a bi-static system. Uh, this, this is uh, the relocatable OTH radar, Rother, it's its acronym. It's, it was made by Raytheon. And I'll talk about that whole technology and a lot of what I think and know about it and stuff like that, having worked and played with the ionosphere uh, a long time. Uh, next are weather radars. Here's the WSR-88, affectionately known as Next, Nextrad. Um, and here's a uh, NOAA output of uh, Hurricane Bertha in 1996. You can easily see what it's doing. In units of DBZ, which are intensity, you probably can't read the DBZ units. It's color-coded. It shows you the eye of a hurricane. This is a repeating GIF file uh, from Wilmington, North Carolina as uh, the eye comes ashore right there into North Carolina. And if you're interested, you can go to their website, hit NOAA, Nextrad, and see gazillions of these. And we'll talk about what frequency it is and how it works and stuff like that. And uh, next we're going to look about space-based remote sensing radars. Uh, this radar was built by Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's on a spacecraft. And the spacecraft flew out to, Mo uh, to meet Venus and mapped Venus with a synthetic aperture radar. Here we see the antenna. And uh, gave fantastic science out. So we're going to talk about space-based remote sensing radars and just go over a few things which I'm going to learn about. I'm, frankly, right now, quite ignorant about it. So I'll spend some time learning about it and put this up so people will be able to see it as one of the uses. Air traffic control for decades and decades and civilians have used radars. Uh, the meat and potatoes of air traffic control radars are the hundreds of air, uh, aircraft surveillance radars that see uh, uh, up to 60 miles, everything from a small pipe of Cherokee to a big 707, and they're located around all the major airports in the country. And these long-range ARSR, this is an ARSR-4 that was made by Northrop Grumman. It is an array-fed uh, reflector. This is a hybrid array. We're going to take a look at that. And these are ASDI radars 
believe this is an ASD4 on a control tower. It spins around fast. At, it's, I think it's a, it's a K band. One, one of the millimeter wave frequencies, I think. Um, and uh, and it, it looks at their ground traffic. And so um, one plane using one way doesn't, uh, you know, get in the wrong direction. And we have a fender bender that kills 200 people. Uh, you know, m many hundreds of people as one plane is taking off goes into another plane crossing the runway. A real disaster. Uh, in the Azores, you remember that terrible disaster that happened. Um, also, a sh uh, 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 what do I call this? Uh, this is a, a, a sh how to call it a boat or a ship. A lot of boats and a lot of ships all have uh, radars that look at other ships and other and, and buoys which have um, corner reflectors on them so they can navigate at night and in the fog. I was hesitating because this is pro probably, uh, you know, it could be uh, uh, a 50 foot luxury ship, not 50, 100, 150 foot luxury ship, but a lot of people with much more modest sailboats will have a radar on them. Um, now, next to ground penetrating radars, I would say up until the uh, uh, the Iraq War, the, the the second Iraq War, uh, people did the only people that used ground penetrating radars. Well, they were used in Vietnam to look for caves of the uh, of the, uh, the for the Viet Cong at, way back in the Vietnam War to some extent in the latter stages. But a lot of people that have used them since the end of that war have been uh, people like these two people who are exploring uh, a burial ground, doing archaeology and looking for uh, archaeological artifacts in the ground. And here we see the output from, uh, uh, here's a, a fellow with the controller and it will have a display that would look something like that. These are uh, images from uh, a Flickr. And here's a fellow with the ground penetrating radar. They operate at uh, very long wavelengths because ground, ground uh, has very high attenuation and those wavelengths it works best at. And you can see the returns from some buried objects in the grounds. I would, and this is a burial ground, so uh, you don't know exactly whether it's coffins or artifacts from an archaeological dig or whatever. Then there's the whole class I alluded to of range instrumentation radars. And I'll go over what they do, how they do, why they do it, at what frequency, and we'll talk about the characteristics of many uh, range instrumentation radars that NASA and the government uses to uh, be scorekeeper, so to speak. And lastly, military systems. This is a subject that's of great interest, obviously, to everyone in the military, but it's, it's a curiosity and an interest, I think, of everyone in the world. And there's a reasonable amount that, that's put out, that's in the open media, uh, about different, uh, different systems. Uh, here's a, a counter battery radar that um, that, it, that was built by uh, a Raytheon subsidiary, a Raytheon, and uh, originally it was they were built by Hughes. And uh, here's a, 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 a military aircraft uh, detection and surveillance and tracking radar for relatively short ranges that Raytheon built. Here's a the Aegis radar is built, uh, half of it's built by uh, Lockheed Martin, the antennas and the signal processors and the transmitters are built by uh, a Raytheon on the Aegis ship destroyer. They're on the, all of the, our whole fleet of cruisers too. And here's, uh, in one of our modern jet fighters in the nose, a uh, slotted antenna uh, the, uh, for an airborne radar. And, and the Joint Stars radar is located here. Here's one of the radars in the uh, Soviet uh, air defense system since the downfall of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union's done a lot of uh, bringing their systems out uh, to the to sell them to other countries, uh, and they put them on, on parade at, at uh, uh, openly market them at uh, air shows. And uh, this is one that was from Wikimedia. Uh, there's a gentleman that I've found out from the web who's taken some fantastic pictures 
of Soviet air defense radars and uh, found a great article that was transmitted to me that was in a European uh, open uh, journal on the history of Soviet air defense radars up to the now and the author was kind enough to send me all the JPEGs and so I'm used, going to be using that as a source um, of some descriptions of some of their stuff. Uh, just like everyone, they don't, you know, in the radar equation you can see there's about nine parameters that really specify a radar. And what will happen is you'll never hear anything told about the signal processor or the exact waveforms or the exact cross-section at what range it can detect. They'll tell you, oh, the class it can, you know. So they grew it up enough so that you can tell something about it, but they're not going to give away their uh, national defense secrets. No one is going to do that. And certainly, uh, I wouldn't go near the edge of that cliff. But I'll give, let's just some interest of some of the things in military systems. Uh, and how they've developed. Um, actually, one thing I want to add at this point, as I go through the whole radar system, uh, the, the, script, the description of radar, I include a lot of non-state-of-the-art radar techniques. Because when we put a radar out there in the field, we don't just put it out there on a, on a, a, uh, uh, on a system. We don't, we don't put that radar out for five years, and then we just get rid of the radar, put a new one in. They're too expensive. We do upgrades to the radars when they're needed. And some of the systems in operational radars in our air traffic control system are things that you'd never today build in an air traffic control system. But since they're out there in the field, operated, I think it's useful to teach about them and teach enough so that people will know uh, the techniques that are uh, antiquated in terms of state of the art or what we, the military would use. But if you really want to build a low cost radar for civilian use, that might be a technique you'd want to use. So, problems. Yes, we're going to have problems for every lecture, even for this introduction. Uh, these are a couple of simple problems you ought to be able to figure out for yourself very easily. I like the last one. I'll even, I'll even read it to you. You're going 75 miles an hour in your new red, bright red Ferrari. A policeman, state trooper, uses his handheld X-band speed radar, clocks you. And he says, uh-oh, this guy's going too, fra too, too, too fast. And uh, assuming you're going 75 miles an hour and it's an X-band radar, um, what? and you're speeding toward his strap, how many hertz is the this 9200 hertz shifted by the Doppler effect? And is it positive or negative? That a little cutesy stuff to it. The others are sort of simple problems to start you off. Believe me, the ones coming up won't be. And it's, to summarize things, hope you have as good luck as I'm having putting this together. And I hope um, we're going to cover an awful lot of ground. This is not... Uh, a course for children. Uh, it's it, it, uh, it's it's like crammed into this is into this size and these topics are not everything I know, but what I can put in this many view graphs for a graduate course. There's a lot of stuff I know that's beyond that, and there are some places in this that I'm a little weak. But, uh, and I'm going to have to get myself in good shape for it because I'm not Mr. Answer Man of everything about radar. And so in the next two topics, there are going to be very quick reviews of what you need to know in these subjects. But don't be forlorn if you don't get everything when you snap through these lectures. I'm going to give you references um, on where you can look on the web to, to take courses in these subjects, video courses. I know there's some really good uh, courses in uh, signals and systems and digital signal processing that are on the uh, Berkeley website. And uh, there's a course with notes in electromagnetics down at MIT's Open Courseware. And I'm going to be searching the web for a video course for that lecture so that you can on your own. The one thing I will add, very easy texts, and I'm going to turn just for a minute to see if I could drag one out. Uh, 
Uh, I can't seem to find one. Uh, the Schwab series on, on uh, signals and systems digital signal processing are very quick and easy ways to pick up the, they're, they're like cliff notes on, on digital signal processing and signals and systems. So you can get through them real quickly and easily and, and understand the things that you need to do. Uh, and in electromagnetics, uh, particularly, in an EM course, uh, the physicists will study electrostatics a lot. Uh, they won't study uh, transmission lines, impedance. The double E's will study impedance and transmission lines, won't spend much time on, a, on um, electrostatics. In the things I point out to you are the subsets of all of electromagnetism that you're going to need to know. So you don't have to go through everything, but know the things that I touch on in these lectures. So good luck to you all on this journey. And um, I hope at the end of it, uh, it all made a, a real difference to your uh, professional development. And hopefully, hopefully after I get through the the uh, that co the core of the course, uh, we'll be developing a relationship with the university so that students can take it the course online and through distance learning have a recitation section, and we can go back and forth with, with questions. Um, and but the mechanics of that, you know, I'm getting way ahead of the ahead of myself when I talk about the logistics of how that's done. I've been talking with a couple of universities; they are very interested in having that kind of a dynamic set up. And uh, good luck to you all. And uh, I hope you enjoy uh, doing this as uh, taking the course. I know it's 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 been a lot of hard work putting this this one particularly together. I really enjoyed putting together the first course. And uh, a lot of people watched it, so it must have done some value. Um, with This is, again, one time I'll implore you. Please let me know if there's anything wrong in this course or there's a piece of the lecture that you just don't get. And you've got the background to understand it. Then what I'll do is I'll, in time, because I'm going to try to rush to get as fast as prudently possible. I'm going to rush to get the core done and then I'm going to go back and redo stuff. And since it's in little bite-sized pieces, I can review the bite-sized pieces. Anyway, let's see if there are any more view graphs. If there aren't, sayonara. There are errors. Okay, here are the references. Um, I first of all want to go back. I did not, uh, in the next lecture, I'll put it on and put it on successively. Here's another new book, an introduction. If I were doing this view graph over, it's the one Principles of Modern Radar by uh, Mark Richards et al. I put that as the second instead of Fred Nathanson's for the ele elementary stuff. Uh, general Toomey's book, he was a general. This is a very, very, very basic r book for the non-specialist. Uh, Bob Buderi has a great book about uh, the evolution of radar and how it affected World War II. And uh, I had a lot of fun reading that. There's uh, uh, Dr. Levin, Professor Levin's book on radar principles, uh, all, all equations, not m many uh, pictures of hardware. And uh, Uri's book in uh, Fundamentals of Applied Math. And I'd also add, for the physicists, Ray would have taken Griffith's book, uh, which I have back here. I won't turn my head and waste your time. but. Uh, Griffiths on uh, electromagnetism. That's the that tends to be the book that physicists take their junior year, and it's the equivalent of this book by Ulibe that uh, electrical engineers take their junior year, which would be great going into the next lecture. You'll do yeah 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 a lot. So take care. Have a great day.